Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Google Cloud Next 2018. Brought to you by Google Cloud and its ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE live coverage here in San Francisco at Moscone South. I'm John Furrier with SiliconANGLE and theCUBE with my co-host Dave Vellante. For the next three days, day one wrap up of Google Next here, Google Cloud's premier event. This is a different Google, it's a world changing event in my opinion of Google. Dave, I want to analyze day one as we put it in the books. Um, let's analyze and let's look at it and critique and observe the moves that Google's making vis-a-vis -vis the competition. And you know, Diane Green, who's won theCUBE earlier, great guest, kind of in her comfort zone here in theCUBE. She talks, she's an engineer, she's super smart. You know, she thinks you know, free thoughts, and she's, but she really has a good chessboard view of the landscape. Um, my big walk away today is that she's got full command of what she wants to do, but she's in an uncomfortable position that I think she's not used to. And that is at VMworld, at VMware, she didn't have competition. First mover, changes the market, um, certainly winning at all fronts when VMware was starting. And they morphed over and then, you know, you know the history been VMware sold the EMC and then now the rest is history. But they really changed the category, they created a category and were very successful in IT with virtual machines. She's got competition in the cloud. She's playing from behind. She's got the big guns. She's got to bring out the howitzers, you know? <laughs> I mean, she's got Spanner, BigQuery, all the scale, Kubernetes, which is the internal name is Borg, which has been running on the Google infrastructure, provisioning services on all their applications with billions and billions of users. If she can translate that, that's key. So that's one observation. The second one is that Google is taking a data-centric view. Their competitive advantage is dealing with data. And if you look at everything that they're doing from TensorFlow for AI and all the themes here, um, they are positioning Google as, we're the place to bring your data. Okay, that is clear to me as the stake in the ground with the large scale technical infrastructure they're going to roll out with SREs. Those two things to me are the front and center um, major power moves that they're making. The rest, wrapping around it, is Kubernetes, Istio, a service-oriented architecture, managing services, not products, and providing large-scale value to their customers that don't want to be Google, they want to be like Google in the benefits of scale, which comes in automation, and I think the headroom for Google Cloud is IT operations. So, you know, that's kind of like my take. I think day one, the people we've had on from Google, sharp as nails, no enterprise tech, Jennifer Lin, Deep D, Diane Green, the list goes on and on. What's your take? Well, so, First of all, I mean, what, what's going on here, and Diane Green, the game she's playing now, completely different, obviously, than VMware. It was all about cutting costs. You know, VMware, when you think about it, sold for $635 million to EMC way back when, so it was a little scratch compared to what we're talking about now. She didn't have the resources. The IT business, you remember Nick Carr's famous uh, 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 piece in the HBR, does IT matter? That was the sentiment back then. IT, waste of time, undifferentiated, just cut costs, cut, cut, cut. Perfect for VMware. The game they're playing now is totally different. As you said, they were late to the enterprise. Ironically, late to the enterprise cloud. They got competition. It, even though they, and they got competition. Obviously, the two, the two big ones, Microsoft and, and of course AWS. But so, what, what my takeaway here is the differentiation. So, they're not panicking. They're obviously playing the open source card, Kubernetes, TensorFlow, et cetera, giving back to the community. Data, they got to, definitely got to lead in AI and machine intelligence, no question about it. So they're going to play that card. The database, we, we, we had uh, the folks from Google, uh, uh, Cloud Spanner on today. Amazing technology. Whereas you think about it, they're, they're, they're talking about a transaction-oriented database. We heard a customer today talking about we replaced Oracle. Right, we got rid of Oracle. When was now, the last time you heard that? Not many it's times. Not often. No, they're only a $120 million company, but, it, but the, her point was, it's game changing for us. It's a 10X value proposition. And we're getting the, the, the same quality that we're getting out of our Oracle databases. Um, they're leading with, with apps on, on you know, Google Cloud, Twitter uh, is there, uh, Spotify, they obviously have a lot of Hadoop you know, history. Uh, so that's part of it. Partner focus. We, on siliconangle.com, is a great article by Mark Alberson. He talked about the, he compared the partner ecosystem. Google's only about 13,000 partners. Amazon, 100,000. Azure, 
70,000, so a long way to go there. Serverless, this, they're catching up in serverless, but still behind, kind of still in beta, right? But serverless, John, I'd love your take on this, can be as profound as virtualization was. Last two, developer love. Um, you know, they've got juice with developers, and then the technology, massive scale. We heard things about, you know, Spanner, the relational semantics, BigQuery, Kubernetes, TensorFlow. They have this automate or die culture. You talked about this in your, in your article, that's a bottoms up engineering culture. Much different than the traditional enterprise top down. Go take that hill, you're going to get shot at, but take that hill by midnight. <laughs> that's true. Well, I mean, well, first of all, I think developers are in charge. I think one of the things that's happening is that's clear is that every company, whether you're a startup or a large enterprise, has to come to grips that they're going to be a software company. And that's easy to say, oh, that's easy, just hire some software developers. No, that's not that easy. One, there's software developers coming out, but the way IT was built and the way people have, were buying IT, it's just not compatible with what software developers want to do. They want to work in a, a company that's actually building software. They don't want to be you know, servicing infrastructure. So saying that everyone's going to be a software company is one thing, that's true. And so that's the challenge. And I think Google has an opportunity just as AWS has been dominating with service-oriented uh, approach, managing services, by creating building blocks that create large scale, that allow people to write software easily. And I think that's the key word. How do I make things common interface? You asked Diane Green about you know, common primitives. They're going to do the foundational work needed. It might be slower, but at a core primitive, They'll do that work because it's going to make everything go faster. This is a different mind shift. So again, you also asked one of the guests, I forget who it was, you know, IT moves at very slow speeds, it's like a caravan. How, who you said glacial. <laughs> they, uh, well that used to be, but they have That's to move true. faster. So the challenge is, how do you blend the speed of technology, specifically on how modern software's being written, when you have cloud scale opportunities, because this is not a cost-cutting environment. People want to press the gas, not the brake. So you have a, a flywheel developing in, in technology where if you are right on a business model observation where you can create differentiation for a business, this is now the cloud's customers. You know, you're a bank, you're a financial institution, you're manufacturing, you're a media company. If you can see an opportunity to create competitive advantage, the cloud is going to get you there really fast. So I'm not too hung up on who's got the better serverless. I look at it like car, I want to drive the car, I want to make sure the engine doesn't fall out or tires don't break, but I mean, so you got to look at, this is a whole nother world. If you're not in the cloud, you're basically on horse and buggy. So yeah, you're not going to have to buy hay, you don't have to deal with horses and clean up all the, the horse crap on the street, I mean, all that goes away. So IT, buying IT is like horse and buggy, cloud is like the sports car, and the question is, do I need air conditioning? Do I need power windows? This is a whole new view and people just want to get the job done. So this is about business, future of work, making money. So and technology is going to facilitate that. So I think the cloud game is going to get different very fast. Well, I want to pick up a couple things you said. You know, software, every company's becoming a software company. To Andreessen said software is eating the world. If software is eating the world, data is eating software. So you've got to become a data company as well as a software company, and data has to be at the core of your business in order to compete, and data is not at the core of most companies' businesses, so how do they close that gap? Yeah. You've talked about the innovation sandwich. Cloud, data, and AI are the sort of the, the, the cocktail that's going to drive innovation yeah. in the future, so if data is not at the core of your company, how are you going to close that AI gap? Well, the way you're going to close it is you're going to buy AI from companies like Google and Amazon and, and others, so that's one point. Yeah, if you don't have an innovation sandwich, if you don't have the data, it's a wish sandwich. You wish you had <laughs> yeah, some you meat. wish you had, right. <laughs> <laughs> wish you had some meat. <laughs> you know? now, the other thing is, you mentioned this, Diane Green in her uh, keynote said, we provide consistency with a common core set of primitives, and I asked her about that because it's really different than what Amazon does. So Amazon, if you think about Amazon's data pipeline, and we know, because we're customers, we, put, we use DynamoDB, we use S3, you know, we use all these different services in the data pipeline. Well, each of those has a different API, and you got to learn that, that world. What Google's doing is they're simplifying that with, a, with a, a common set of primitives. Now, 
the, Diane mentioned, she said there's a trade-off. It takes us longer to get to market. Yeah, and but the problem is, here's the problem. Multi-cloud is re, a real dynamic. So even though they have a common set of primitives, if you go to Azure or AWS, you still have different primitives over there. So the world of multi-cloud isn't as simple as saying moving workloads yet. So although you're starting to see good signs within Google to see, oh, that's on-prem, that's in the cloud. Okay, that's hybrid within Google. The question is, when I have, don't have to hire an IT staff to manage my deployments on Azure, my deployments on AWS, that's a whole different world. You still got to learn skill sets on those other, True, on but, other clouds. True, but, but as your pipeline, as your data pipeline grows and gets more and more complex, you've got to have you know, skill sets that grow, and that's fine, but then it's really hard to predict where I should put data sometimes, and what, until you get the bill at the end of the month. You go, oh, I should have put that in S3 instead of Aurora, wh whatever it is. And so Google's trying to simplify that and, and solve that problem, just a different philosophy. Stu Miniman asked Andy Jassy about this and his, and his answer on theCUBE was, look, we want to have fine-grained control of those primitives in case the market changes, we can make the change and it doesn't affect all the other APIs that we have. So that was the trade-off that they made, number one. Number two, he said, we can get to market faster. And Diane admitted, it slows us down, but it simplifies things. Different philosophy, which comes back to differentiation. If you're going to win in the enterprise, you have to believe. I get the sense that these guys believe. Well, I think there's a, there's a belief, but there's architectural decisions. Amazon and Google are completely different animals. If you look at Amazon and look at some of the decisions they make, their client base is significantly larger. They in, have been, been in business longer. The sets of services that they have dwarf Google. Google is like, you know, on the, on the bar charts Andy Jassy puts up, it's like, like here and everyone else is kind of down here, Google's down yeah, here. And the customer references, I mean, it's just off so the charts. So Google, Google is doing, they're picking their spots to compete in but they're doing it in a very smart engineering way. They can bring out the big guns, and this is what I would do, I love this strategy. You got hardened, large-scale technology that's been used internally, and you're not trying to peddle that to customers, you're tweaking it and making it consumable. Big table, uh, big query, a spanner. This is tech, Kubernetes. This is Google essentially being smart. Consuming the tech is not necessarily shoving it down someone's throat. Amazon, on the other hand, has much more of a composability side. So, and some people will use some services in Amazon and not others. So, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't judge that right now. It's too early to tell. But these are philosophy decisions. Um, we'll see how the bet pans out. That's a little bit longer term. I, I want to ask you about the Cisco deal uh, because it seems like a match made in heaven. Um, and I want to talk specifically about some of the, the enterprise guys, particularly Dell, Cisco, and HPE. <laughs> you got Dell with yeah. VMware in bed with Amazon in a big way. We, we were just down at DC last yeah. month. We heard all about that and we're going to hear more about it in, in this fall at, at reInvent. Cisco today does a deal with Google. Perfect match, right? Cisco needs a cloud, Google needs an enterprise partner, boom. Where's that leave HP? HP's got no cloud, right? And, yeah. And are they trying to align? I guess, I guess Azure, right? Google's, tight with, Google's ascension. Is that, is that where they go? They fall to, to Azure? Well, that's, the, that's what, the habit is, that's the relationship, the wind tell. Right. But, but uh, back up for with HP a second. The ascension of Google Cloud into the upper echelon of players will hurt a few people. One of them is obviously Oracle, right? And they mentioned Oracle and the Cloud Spanner thing. So I think Oracle will be flat footed by if Google Cloud continues the ascension. HPE is, uh, has to rethink, and they kind of look bad on this because they should be partnering with Google Cloud because they have no cloud themselves. And the same with Dell. If I'm Dell and HP, I got to get out of the IT ops decimation that's coming because IT operations and the manageability piece is going to absolutely be decimated in the next five years. If you're in the IT ops business or IT management, ITOM, ITIL, it's going to get crushed. It's going to, it's going to absolutely decimate. It's going to get vaporized. The value is going to be shifted to another part of the stack and if you're not looking at that, if you're HPE, you could essentially get flat-footed and get crushed. So, HP's got to be thinking differently. But what Google and Amazon have, in my opinion, and maybe you can even stretch and say Alibaba if you want a gateway to China, is that what the Wintel relationship of Windows and Intel back in the 80s and 90s, that created massive innovation. So I see a similar dynamic going on now where the cloud players, I'm calling them cloud native, Amazon and Google, for instance, are creating that new dynamic. I didn't mention Microsoft, because I don't consider them yet in the formal position to be truly enabling the kind of value that Google and Amazon will value because really? of the, the tech. Why not? I think Amazon's more of a compatible, I mean Microsoft's more of a compatibility mode. I run, I, I mean, Microsoft, I run Microsoft, yeah. I got a SQL Server, I got Office, Azure's got good enough, I don't really, I'm not looking for 10X improvement. 
So I think a lot of Microsoft's success is just holding the line and the growth in stock has been a function of the operating model of cloud and we'll see what they do at their show, but I think Microsoft's got to up their game a bit. Now they're, they're not mailing it in, they're doing a good job, but I just think Google and Amazon are stronger cloud native players straight up on paper, right? And if you look at their capability. So the HPEs and the ecosystems have to figure out who's the new partner that's going to make the market and you know, rising tide will float all boats. So I mean, to me, if I'm at HP, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I got managed services, I better get out in front of the next wave where I'm driftwood. Well, Oracle's an interesting case too. You mentioned Oracle. Somebody said to me today, Oracle, they're really hurting. I'm like, most companies would love to be hurting that badly. But Oracle's their, not hurting. Their strategy of, you know, same, same, but it's this, it's this same Oracle stack brought into the cloud. They're sending a message to their customers that like, look, you don't have to go to another cloud. We'll, we got you covered. We're investing in R&D, which they do, by the way. But it was really interesting to hear from the, the Cloud Spanner customer today that they got a 10x value prop, 10x reduction in cost, and a, and a 10x capability of, of scaling relative to Oracle. That was powerful to hear that. There's no doubt in my mind, Oracle's not hurting. Oracle's got thousands and thousands of customers that do you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue in categories that are, would, people would love to have. The question on Oracle is the price pressure is an innovator's dilemma because there's no doubt that Oracle could just snap a few fingers and replicate the kind of deliverables that people are offering. The question is, can they get the premium that they're used to getting, one. Number two, if everyone's a software company, are they truly delivering the value that's expected to be a software company, to be competitive, not to, to make the lights run, but or to enable, to enable competitive advantage yeah. at a level, that's to me going to be the, the real test of how cloud morphs, what? and I question that you know, you got to be agile and you got to have real, real top line revenue numbers. We're using technology at a cost benefit ratio that drives value. But, but where they'll, if Oracle can get there, then that's, we'll the, see. The reason why they'll continue to win is because they, they'll, they move at the speed of the CIO, the CIO, and they'll say all the right things. They'll say AI infused and blockchain and machine learning and all that stuff, and, well, and, want, and, and the CIOs will eat it up because it's a safe bet. Well, I want to get your thoughts, because I talked about this a couple years ago. Last year we started harping on it, we got more into the CUBE conversation around cloud being horizontally scalable, yet at the top of the stack you got vertical differentiation, that's great for data. Diane Green in her keynote said that the vertical focus with engineering resources tied to its key part of their strategy, highlighted healthcare was their first vertical, talked about, um, you know, um, uh, National Institute of Health deal. Retail. NGOs, financial service, manufacturing, transportation, gaming and media. You got uh, Fortnite on there now, all customer of both clouds, startups and retail. Yeah, had the vertical targets, you, vertical so. strategy is kind of an old enterprise playbook team. Is that a viable one? Because now with the kind of data, if you get the data sandwich, maybe specialism and verticals can scale. Your thoughts? I'll tell you why it is. Well, I'll tell you why it's viable. Because of digital. So for years, these, these vertical stacks were, are, have been hardened, and the expertise and the business process and the knowledge within that vertical industry, retail, transportation, financial services, et cetera, has been hardened. But with digital, you're seeing, you're seeing it all over the place. Amazon getting into content, getting in, Apple getting into to, to, to content, Amazon getting into groceries, Google getting into healthcare. So digital allows you to not only disrupt horizontally at the technology layer, but also vertically within industries. I think it's a very powerful yeah. disruption agenda. Well, analytics seems to be the killer app. That's the theme here, data. And if you take it the next step, that's where the specialism is, that's where the value is created. Why not have vertical yeah. specialty? No, it makes and, a lot of and, sense. And it's a different spin. It's not the traditional stack. to hire a bunch of people with that knowledge in that stack. No, it's, it's really innovate and change the game and change the business model. I a, love it. That was a great surprise for me. Yeah. Uh, Dave, great kick, kicking off day one here this morning, ending day one here with this wrap up. We've got three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Go to siliconangle.com. We've got a great cloud special, Rob Hove, editor-in-chief and the team, Mark Alberson and the rest of the crew. Put some great stories together and go to thecube.net and check out the video coverage there. That's where we're going to be live. Of course, wikibon.com for the analyst coverage uh, from Peter Burris and his team. Check that out. Of course, theCUBE here. Day one, thanks for watching. See you tomorrow. <laughs>